We are finding the common ground. We are getting stuff done. This week in Pennsylvania, Governor Josh Shapiro touts his accomplishments while acknowledging there's still work to do. A federal court rules on those problematic, undated mail-in ballots. Should they stay or should they go? The verdict is in. And state lawmakers are really thankful to taxpayers for the automatic raises they'll be getting come December 1st. Hello, welcome to This Week in Pennsylvania. Hope you're having a great Thanksgiving weekend. I'm Dennis Owens, covering hot topics in PA policy and politics, as well as the issues that are important to you and your family. More green for lawyers in the battle over the greenhouse gas initiative that has gripped the state for years. It is now headed to the PA Supreme Court. Governor Josh Shapiro announced Tuesday that he's appealing a Commonwealth Court ruling that Governor Wolf did not have the power to unilaterally put the state into the greenhouse gas initiative because it is a tax on polluters and all taxing legislation must come from the legislature. In a statement, Shapiro said he is appealing to protect gubernatorial powers but would like to see a resolution that does not involve the courts, saying, quote, should legislative leaders choose to engage in constructive dialogue, the governor's confident we can agree on a stronger alternative to Reggie. If they take their ball and go home, they will be making a choice not to advance common sense energy policy that protects jobs, the environment, and consumers in Pennsylvania. Environmental groups applauded his appeal. Pro-business groups and GOP lawmakers ripped it. It was illegally adopted by the Wolf administration, uh, and we need to move on. Um, he is booking last year's budget. He booked over $600 million in revenue from that tax. That means consumers, you, me, and businesses will pay $600 million in higher energy costs if Reggie is implemented. That is a tax. Now, while Governor Shapiro is appealing the Reggie ruling, private and Catholic school officials are appealing to the legislature to finish the budget, especially additional money for a tax credit program that funds scholarships to their institutions. It seems the cash is a casualty of the partisan clash at the Capitol. Trinity High School principal John Kaminsky is proud of his staff, his students, his school. Our cost to educate is, is, is very low and the kids that go through our system produce for Pennsylvania. He says about 40% of them get tuition aid from the Educational Improvement Tax Credit, which lets donors contribute in exchange for a rebate on their state taxes. The money funds needs-based scholarships. It is a program that has traditionally enjoyed bipartisan support, and in this day and age, the more of that we have, the better. But the program has hit a partisan snag. Right now, it's, again, in a stalemate deadlock. EITC got $405 million last year. Budget negotiations promised an additional $150 million this year. That extra cash caught up in budget bickering. House Democrats removed it from a school codes bill last week. So we had our priorities. Democrat Paul Takak is on the House Education Committee. The Senate stripped out the Democratic priorities and kept the Republican priorities. So... This Sounds is like politics. It does indeed. Seth Grove is the Republican Appropriations Chairman. Um, to me, it's just being petty, um, given the lateness of this budget. Petty, perhaps problematic, absolutely. You know, this because it is funded by donations. Uh, these schools have to go out and raise that money, and as later we get in the year, it's going to be more and more difficult to actually raise that money. We have money on the line. Kaminsky says he made promises to students, anticipating that boost in funding. We've pledged to those families thinking that that pot of money would be uh, freed up. It may end up being a tough lesson for the educator, but he says this to those who question why any state money, even tax credits, support private schools. Our schools produce really fine young people. Our families pay taxes. Our donors are willing to share some of that with the families in need, and the results speak for themselves. Lawmakers do come back for three days in mid-December. Those school officials hope that they're in a giving mood and free up that extra $150 million. So while lawmakers have not yet found more money for EITC, they will get more money for themselves, called a cost of living adjustment. In 1995, the legislature passed a controversial law giving themselves an annual salary increase based on the rate of inflation. That changes every year. That raise kicks in December 1st and will be 3.5% this year. This also applies to the governor and state judges. Rank and file legislators now make $106,000 a year. Leaders make even more. 
Well, the actual calendar may not say 2024, but the political calendar certainly does, and the field for attorney general uh, candidates is expanding. Former Delaware County DA Kat Copeland, a Republican, is in. She's been a prosecutor for, the, uh, for 20 years and served in the U.S. Attorney's Office. She's the first GOP challenger to York County DA Dave Sunday in the GOP primary. Democrats include Eugene Pasquale, Joe Kahn, Keir Bradford Gray, and Jared Solomon. They're all running. Current AG Michelle Henry is not running. Speaking of elections, a federal court has weighed in on the much maligned mail-in ballot law in Pennsylvania. It ruled this week that mail-in ballots cannot be tossed out just because there's an issue with the date on the envelope, even though the law says they should not count. The court said disqualifying ballots based solely on a date issue violates the Civil Rights Act. As long as the person met all of the legal qualifications to vote and the Board of Elections received their ballot on time, no word yet on possible appeals. President Biden celebrated his 81st birthday this week with a pardon that you could call foul. In what is an annual Thanksgiving tradition at the White House, yes, I did say that, uh, Biden pardoned two turkeys. The birds are from Minnesota, but they're named with a nod to Philadelphia, Liberty and Bell. The turkeys received a red carpet greeting and even stayed a night in a luxury hotel in Washington, D.C. Lots of deer in PA Woods right about now wishing for similar pardons. We're coming back to talk about a major and surprising health care issue in Pennsylvania, maternal mortality. Stay with us. Welcome back to This Week in Pennsylvania. That was Governor Josh Shapiro, State Representative Morgan Cephas at a bill signing earlier this year. Uh, Representative Cephas is joining us. She's a Democrat from Philadelphia. The topic is maternal mortality. And the uh, United States is the worst developed nation for this. 700 women a year die in childbirth. Uh, maternal morbidity is also an issue. What would your bill, thanks for being with us, first of all, on this Thanksgiving weekend, but what would your bill do and why is it necessary? So uh, first and foremost, thank you for covering this issue. Um, this is a challenge that not just is an issue here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but as you stated, a challenge across our country. And we are the worst industrialized nation uh, with these numbers. So we really need to hone in and be in intentional on legislation and funding resources to ensure that we're addressing this issue. So with Senate Bill uh, 262, with my colleague, Senator Judy Schwenk does, it now will require our maternal mortality review committee to also report on maternal morbidity. As we know, as you stated, close to 700 birthing people uh, pass away. And I will mention that uh, the New York Times actually reported there's been a 14% increase in maternal deaths uh, during COVID. Um, so what this bill does is our morbidity numbers, you know, far exacerbate the, the mortality numbers. So it will require the review committee to start reporting on these numbers. And why that's important is because in order to make change, we have to understand the data and understand what's happening on the ground. So if it's not measured, it's not managed. And this gives us an opportunity to do that. And I want our viewers to understand. So mortality, we understand that. That means uh, a mom dies. But what is morbidity? How is that defined? So morbidity is when someone has, um, an individual has complications uh, during the pregnancy, during the labor period, and during the postpartum period. And, you know, oftentimes these morbidity issues uh, tend to lead to deaths if they're not uh, taken care of immediately. Or they could potentially, you know, impact abilities to uh, a person's ability to just live a quality of life that is respectable or to maintain a job. I mean, one of the biggest stories that you heard about was Sen um, Serena Williams yep. and the expose that she did uh, about her complications while she was in the hospital. And I'm sure just based on what she experienced, uh, she had challenges coming out of the hospital after giving birth. Are there gaps in the data collection right now uh, requiring your bill? So um, we this will give this an, an opportunity to actually just start reporting. Um, I do not think uh, there will be gaps uh, in the numbers that will be coming out of our hospitals. But I mean, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to get this started. So we can see if there are gaps in, in the numbers where we can 
fill those holes. If if it's more infrastructure, uh, healthcare infrastructure that we have to build out to ensure that the data is collected, then that is something that, you know, we need to go to our governor with about, you know, making some type of fiscal investment. So, but we won't be able to do any of that or to really address the issue in Pennsylvania until we start this process. So that's what the bill does. And it also does another critical piece. Um, prior to this bill, uh, the reporting for maternal uh, mortality was every three years. Now we will be doing it every year so we can get data back in real time. I did want to bring a medical professional into the conversation. I spoke with Dr. Cherie Livingston. She's an OBGYN for UPMC. She knows it's jarring and uncomfortable to hear, but she says systemic racism is one of the culprits. Give a listen. Black women are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth. And we in the obstetric community know and understand that if we can improve maternal health for the most vulnerable, that all maternal lives will improve because we will focus on the weak uh, links, the uh, issues that are most pervasive in the most vulnerable. But we do know that health disparities and the lack of um, health care or affordable health care in all communities contributes to uh, these health disparities. And so it doesn't make any of us feel good. It doesn't. And it shouldn't because when black women are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth, we have to uh, look at that and face it directly in the face and say, how can we address this? So Representative Cephas, how can we address this? Do you agree with her point? Absolutely. I mean, again, um, I often say when America catches a cold, uh, black communities get pneumonia. And, uh, you know, if we don't address, you know, the most those individuals that are disproportionately most impacted by this issue, we won't be able to address the larger issues, you know, across this community and with our birthing people. Um, they say rising tide lifts all boats. And if, you know, we are able to cut down on the number of black uh, birthing people that are dying during uh, labor and during the postpartum period, I do feel like we'll be able to make a dent in this issue. Issue. And, you know, some of the things that, you know, we're going to be looking to do first and foremost, uh, thankful to our governor, um, Shapiro, he invested $2.3 million specifically in maternal health to, you know, fund things like uh, innovation funds. So when, you know, hospitals like UPMC create technology that best support individuals where they are as it relates to this, there needs to be funding made available for that. But we also need to look at how do we um, expand our perinatal workforce. Um, there's been a large conversation about how doulas are able to, you know, impact a birthing person's experience and actually be their advocate um, while they're in the hospital. We know um, starting in 2024, they will now be reimbursed by Medicaid. We need to make sure uh, private insurers are um, able to, you know, pay for doulas as well, because almost the average cost for a doula is roughly around $200. So, you know, we need to get innovative um, and, you know, taking a deeper dive in the data to see what changes we need to make, you know, both in the hospital, but also, you know, in our communities at large to, again, help support birthing people across Pennsylvania. Only have a few seconds, but some people might be out there saying that's not as much race as it is poverty. The lack of uh, good nutrition, rides perhaps to the doctor, prenatal care, uh, diabetes, getting the treatment you need. A lot of that can be poverty as much as it is race. Is that accurate or not accurate? So um, you do have to look at the social determinants of health as it relates to individuals um, that are, you know, preparing for birth. You know, do they have access to transportation? You know, uh, black women are paid 56 you know, cents on a dollar. So economics definitely comes into it. But what I'd say as it relates to race, explain uh, Serena Williams. She has, you know, the most access yep. to economic opportunity than I do. She's in... <laughs> almost mo the best shape, yep. better shape than I am. Um, but she still, you know, experienced, you know, racism in the hospital bed. And there was, you know, there uh, an assumption that, you know, black yep. bodies are able to 
uh, are more acceptable to pain than, you know, any other race. And, you know, when you look at the challenges that she's had, um, economics and, um, you know, poverty doesn't explain her situation. So okay. that's when you know it, um, race is, uh, is an underturn, on, undertone to this issue. Fair point. Much more conversation to be had, but we're out of time. Uh, thank you on this Thanksgiving week for joining us and for your efforts. Stay with us much more this week in Pennsylvania when we come back. And I believe in my heart that we can do big things here in Pennsylvania. That the work we did in Northeast Philadelphia together over those couple weeks on that stretch of road, that shouldn't be the exception. It should be the norm. Getting big things done. GSD, as he likes to say, and he doesn't always say stuff, by the way. Just for the record, uh, you both were at the same press club mm -hmm. event I was at, Governor Shapiro. Wrapping up the first year, talking about all of his accomplishments, still says there's work to be done. Mm -hmm. Takeaways, Shapiro, 11 months in. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. He's uh, had a little bit of a challenge. Um, he pointed out that he is the... A little bit. <laughs> a little bit um the, the pennsylvania has a divided government and he is he said because the budget's the only, still not officially yes, done as that, we know. there's still lots of challenges because it's a divided government um pennsylvania is the only one with a state with a full-time legislature that's divided yeah that's the distinction virginia has the same yeah. thing yes. but they're technically part-time so um it was a tale of two speeches uh, and by the way, I'm Chris Nicholas, and this is Daniel <laughs> yes. Gross. We are the analysts on the show for now, a couple of years now. Um, so it Somebody was, didn't introduce them. Yeah, it, it, it was funny. Well, well, that'll be your Thanksgiving uh, pardon, Dennis. It was interesting that you had, I think, two very different uh, reactions to that speech in front of the press, press club, which is basically a lot of Republican politicos, a lot of Democrat politicos and lobbyists, Republican lobbyists, that's who the audience yeah. is. Um, so it was interesting that he could say one thing in the speech and literally people sitting next, you know, because they could, the audience was allowed to write questions in and ask questions. Yeah, so it was challenging exactly. Things. So, I mean, um, it, to me, the takeaway was we're still without a finalized state budget, but he doesn't really think that's his problem, he thinks only the leg legislature needs to deal with that. Commonwealth Court was pretty clear that it was a tax of trying to put Pennsylvania into Reggie by Governor Wolf. Governor, governors can't do that. The legislature must. Josh Shapiro this week, in the big headline, really, he is going to appeal that to the Supreme Court. We should mention that you have some clients that uh, yes. support Reggie. So yes. just so so we know that. But I have uh, no clients that support or, or detract <laughs> from You got Reggie. no dog in the fight. I got no dog in the fight. I will note, though, that there are nine judges on the Commonwealth Court. Five of them were put together as a panel. Three of the five were Democrats. They voted two to one. Uh, against the governor's position on Reggie, as both Republicans did. So that's how you got a four to one answer uh, result. So my question is, maybe you know, why does Governor Shapiro think the Democrats on the Supreme Court are going to vote differently than the Democrat on the Commonwealth Court? Well, I think they explained this in why they were appealing is that it, they, uh, it looks like to me like the Shapiro administration sees this as a test of the gubernatorial authority. So th they're not maybe appealing on the basis of Reggie per se as a piece of legislation or, or as a- as a. It's more of a process. But yes, it's more like but a process. But let's talk practical for a minute. Does this buy him some time to try to force people to the table? And by the way, the Senate leader, Joe Pittman said, we're not gonna have an anvil over our head, but does that force them to the table, try to come up with a plan that everybody can work well, with? Well, he has brought people to the table, yeah. the industry, um, the energy industry, the clean yeah. en energy folks, all kinds of stakeholders have already been to the table. And it's the Senate leadership who have literally said, we're going to take our ball and go home. We don't even want to be part of this. They're just complaining about this. They're not providing any solutions. The industry knows that the energy industry knows that you know, there are all kinds of regulations and things that are going to decimate their ability to produce energy in the future. And I've lived in Cambria County. I know what it's like when an industry shrivels up and dies in front of you. Yeah. And the only people who are trying to do anything So you'll are sign the my letter to the yeah. governor trying to tell him to <laughs> All right. To, to Quick time out. <laughs> we got well, don't go anywhere. Much more uh, in this week in Pennsylvania comes right back. Welcome back to Pennsylvania, uh, This Week in Pennsylvania. Let me be clear, I am so thankful on this week to have analysts Christopher Nicholas and Danielle Gross <laughs> and sometimes Brittany Crancy. We appreciate all of you. Thank you for being here. We try but, and carry you every week. And so. <laughs> yeah, that's not an easy task. Uh, uh, a federal court rules this week that that whole issue over an undated mail-in, you can't toss the ballot if that's the only problem. 
Uh, so, the problem, many say, is what the law says otherwise. Well, yeah, I mean, that pesky law uh, that we now want to ignore, according to Democrats in Pennsylvania, said you needed this. That law was put together by Democrats and Republicans in the House and Senate, okayed by Governor Wolf. They all have lots of lawyers, right? Um, so I hope this now ultimately gets to the U.S. Supreme Court so we can, once and for all, uh, that's why we have a U.S. Supreme Court, know if we're allowed to have this in a law, and if we do, do we actually have to follow it? Or, and are there other parts of other laws we can just kind of sweep under the rug? Well, Danielle? you know, poll taxes and liter literacy tests were also legal in barring uh, people Putting from a date voting. Putting not a tax. It, it really, the, these, <laughs> these ballots don't transfer through time and space. <laughs> they literally go from point A to point B. They have a stamp on them. They get from one place to another in time. And they're scanned almost the whole entire time in the process by the Postal There's Service. There's a whole litany So, of, I mean, of, maybe you're excited about laws that keep people from having their votes count, but I mean, it's a constitutional right. So there is a much higher bar. And the higher bar is the Civil Rights Act. I so, just talked with Judge mm -hmm. John Jones before mm -hmm. the show. He said that's, that, that trumps state so, law. So here's a neat idea. Vote in person. Most people live very close to their polling place. I know that's anathema for my Democratic friends to encourage that. And that way you don't have to worry about dates and envelopes. Just walk into your precinct. Yeah, but they're supposed to, uh, it, it, the theory is it expands it to more people, and a lot of people like uh, that. Not, that. And that then you don't have to, to there's all kinds of restrictions to, to voting at, by absentee. The whole Act 77 got started, started when um, uh, uh, law enforcement couldn't legally vote by absentee mail because they live and work in the same city and they can't vote by absentee ballot. If and by the way, that. we're scheduled for a primary on the first day of Passover. I don't see it changing unless right. it changes. A lot of people well, of the Jewish the, faith might want to use that mail-in to, to avoid having to go in person. Well, the Chris Nicholas plan is let's move the primary back to the third Tuesday <laughs> in May when it is the other three years out of four. We know how to do that. That would be my way to help our Jewish friends and neighbors not have to make that choice. How likely is it the legislature is listening to the Chris Nicholas plan? Come on. <laughs> Give me at least one percent, folks. Jeez. I am I am thankful for you both. Thank you Thank so much. You. I'm at least trying to come up with a solution, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> and we are thankful for our audience that joined us. Hope to see you next uh -huh. week on This Week.